Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Nate Winky podcast. And today I have a special guest, Tyler Panzer. I think I said that right, or am I a little off there? A little off. Second end. So Panzer. But Panzer. 98% okay. there. All right. All right. We're close. We're close. Um, but yeah, really excited to have him on. Um, first heard about him from the Harley Sealbinder podcast. And he had a really good conversation with Harley, um, an expert in what he does. And I guess that leads us to the first question What do you do? So my education is in cell biology. Um, I got my bachelor's in science in cell and molecular biology, and I got my PhD in cellular and molecular pharmacology. Um, I'll save you the question most people ask, you know, pharmacologist, pharmacist, doctor, you know, what is all that? So the way I like to put it is pharmacists, which I get confused with for all the time, um, they take existing knowledge we know about clinical applications of drugs and in a retail space, they can distribute them um, or they can be involved in clinical trials. But pharmacologists, I was the guy wearing the lab coat and the goggles doing the research to learn how to develop new drugs. So it's all about innovation. Um, For my PhD, I literally had to prove something and publish a paper um, that no one else has done before. So the first half of that, I studied neuropharmacology how drugs and substances affect the brain. Um, that just always interests me a lot. I was making my own pre-workouts back in college and stuff. Just, you know, it was – back then, it was just Stim City. You know, it was um, – felt like – almost a little like you were on Adderall with all the different stuff I had oh, going yeah. on in there. It was it, it was nice. a really, really great lift, awesome day. You were buzzing, you know. Um, but learning how to tinker with these things got me really fascinated in it. Um, and then I actually did my – breast cancer research was my thesis. So I published um, some papers involving breast cancer and you think these little things called exosomes, how cells can communicate with each other across the body. Um, but I really got interested in personalized medicine when 23andMe became a thing. And I've struggled with, I didn't realize it back then, but I felt a weird, I felt off a lot of the time. I had very high histamine, very prone to allergies and the foods I was eating, they were healthy. I've always been a huge fitness guy, always big into with lifting weights, cardio, and getting good rest. And I still wouldn't feel that great. And my 23andMe revealed a lot of things related to histamine, vitamin D, um, explaining my anxiety. I've always struggled with anxiety. Um, and I was able to improve those. And I would say as close to cure as you can get. You know, yeah. like everyone always with genetic stuff, it's, it's hard to really totally change the gene completely. You can't edit the gene or, I mean, you can't, we could talk about that later. Um, but, (laughs) um, for the holistic context, um, you, I figured why not figure out, give our cells what our cells genetically need. Different people's cells can have a different genetic hunger. Some need more vitamin A, some need more vitamin E, some can get more inflamed if they have more vitamin E and some people don't. So I, um, joined a clinical genomics company that was doing personalized cancer treatments, Carry your screen. If you want to see if you and your wife have a chance of having a horrible genetic defect, you would both get sequenced and compare that, which is interesting, but I've always been the natural first type of guy. I've been a big natural supplement guy, vitamins, and I wanted to apply that in the natural context. Why are we only doing it for people that have cancer? Mm. So um, I actually left that position about three weeks ago, but about eight months ago, I started my practice, which I call holistic genetic health optimization. And that's basically utilizing your DNA, finding out what your cells have an increased need for, what can harm them if you have too much of it, and what pathways may be overactive so you can kind of suppress them a little bit using natural methods. And starting with that first with clients and seeing how far you can go with that. And I've seen over 130 clients since, and the results have been amazing. You know, I'll never be that guy that says, Take my magic pills. They'll fix everything. You know, yeah. I'm a holistic. I'm concerned with what's going to bring people the most health and vitality in their life. Not even just reversing diseases when you're elderly, but right here, right now. How old are you? 22. 22. Okay. Yeah, I turned yep. 30. And like I see so many people around our age that are sharing memes how they're depressed and anxious and this and that and yeah. chronically fatigued and low testosterone. And that's not how it should be. You should be bouncing out of bed, excited every day. Of course, we all have our bad days. You know, no one's sure. immune to that stuff. But I really think that people should have energy and be excited about what they're doing. Now, of course, parts of it's part of its lifestyle, part of it's the toxins in our world. But 
Even your genetics dictate how you respond to stress, how you respond to heavy metals, how you respond to mold. So all these things people consider non-genetic environmental, they're actually in part dictated by the genetics, yeah. which you can figure that out. So it's been almost it's been almost a month now. Actually, a month will be tomorrow technically that I've been doing this full time and sky's the limit, I think. I don't even really yeah. know how many issues, how far can this go? You know, can we reverse cancer by giving your cells what they've lacked their entire life? I'm far from saying that on the record that that can happen. Sure, you know, no sure, one come after yeah. me, put your pitchforks <laughs> down, but no one's done it this way before. So where is anxiety, depression, hmm. gut, gut pain, gut health, joint pain, um, fertility, longevity, energy, sleep, all these things I have proven success with doing holistic methods based on the genes. So again, how far can this really yeah. go? If I could help people with depression due to neuroinflammation, Alzheimer's also involves neuroinflammation, you know? So it's kind of like, that's why I never want to be, I love being in the holistic space, but I never want to fully let go. I want to help come back around and help conventional medicine as well. Because at the yeah. end of the day, no matter what, people will still get cancer. We still need big pharma. Yeah. Even though they're shady as fuck in a lot of ways, they keep us, we scrape our knee. And we don't die of an infection because we have antibiotics from Big Pharma. So we do need them. But um, yeah, that's what I do. I know it's a mouthful. Yeah. No, no, you're good. It's uh, it's awesome to see your enthusiasm. So seriously, I love it to see when people are passionate about what they do. That's just huge. So what made you initially decide to switch? And, and you, you said you basically you have your own company, right? Is it yep. just you? Yeah. Okay. Right, right now, it's just me. I'm trying to, you know, I'm... It's a blessing that I've been having, you know, such traffic lately, but I'm realizing yeah. like oh, I need man. to build a team. Yeah. I need to get that going because it's like I'm starting to drown over here. You know what I mean? But I decided to – so I was doing the PhD and giving mice – crossing mice, making them have cancer, taking out the tumors, digesting them. And mm. I do really miss – there's something different about doing an experiment planning it that no one's ever asked this question before and doing that. So I really do miss that, but clearly yeah. that creative mindset, I just applied in a new context. You know, I love doing new things, building upon what people have already done. Um, but part of it was I actually found out I was severely allergic to mice at the end of my PhD. Um, that's so histamine stuff. I realized yeah. I was severely allergic to mice. I felt so foggy, anxious, lethargic while I was at lab. I thought it was like mm. chemical fumes. I thought it was fluorescent light bulbs giving me inflammation, which there are studies that show that. But turns out I was severely allergic to mice and I'm severely allergic to peas and almonds. I ate them every day. But wow. I never got a single hive, rash, sneeze. All the stuff people normally think of allergies, I never got. So I never had any idea. And that was one of the things that made me realize, holy fucking shit, I suffered – for years in that lab with brain fog while I was at lab from the histamine spike and it could have been completely avoided. How many other people are dealing with stuff like this? And I just really didn't, even though I got trained in pharmacology, I know how all these drugs work. We're not looking to see what the actual root issue is. I like to put it as, I kind of came to the conclusion I was studying the cell biology and cell signaling of diseases. There's infinite flavors of diseases. A good example I like to give, let's just say depression. Um, some people can have mutations where they produce too little serotonin. Other people can have mutations. They produce too little dopamine. So if you go to the doctor, they give you a Zoloft or a Paxil that raises serotonin. Yeah. They're going to be, if your serotonin is not the issue, they're going to be doubling your serotonin. So all side effects will not fixing the dopamine or it could be a histamine type issue. High histamine in the brain is directly linked to lower serotonin and dopamine production. Interesting. Or it could be vitamin D. Low vitamin D reduces the production oh, yeah. of serotonin and dopamine and permits more inflammation in your brain. Um, or it could be the thing, the catch is though, everyone is a mixture of all of those. Yeah. I like to think of it as everyone's like a canvas. We all have different colors, meaning signaling systems. So our cells don't just have a happy pathway or a sleep pathway. There's dozens of different pathways that all intertwine together. So mm -hmm. let's just take for uh, – Anxiety, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, no, we'll go back to the depression. Keep it the same. Okay. Um, yep. So like I said, you can have this – let's just say serotonin is the color red on the canvas. Vitamin D is blue and histamine is green. Someone can have mutations for too little of serotonin, a little bit of too little red, too much histamine, too much green. 
And then everyone has the same colors because all of our cells have the same pathways. People ask, do I have this gene or that gene? We all have the same exact genes. It just depends what's mutated or not. And based on how those mutations can compound on top of each other, some people, the enzyme that makes serotonin only works 10% as well as it should. So no matter what, those are the people that have just been down depressed their whole life, always kind of somber. I like to think of Eeyore from uh, Pooh Bear, just very just somber and kind of like dreary. And it probably runs in their family and they get the sunlight. They do everything else they should be doing correctly. They still are depressed. So a lot of people I work with have tried everything else. They're still not happy or healthy. And that means it's primarily the genes. And that's why with a lot of my clients, I see a lot of these compounding mutations. Because if you went to all these other regular, then holistic doctors, and they tried everything, it's not working. What's the one part of health I think is the least understood, the most overlooked? It's the genetics. Mold is very important. Toxins, metals. But there's so many holistic coaches that are helping with that. I'm only aware of, I think, two or maybe three other genetic coaches like me doing this in a holistic con- co- uh, context. And I've scoured all of Instagram, let alone like a brick and mortar establishment somewhere, yeah. just because that's way ahead of where the medicine's at. But yeah, overall, in short, it was just the lack of personalization. So realizing everyone's this canvas, you can have five different people with five different flavors of depression. So why am I going to work to develop a drug that just everyone gets or in my contact, it was cancer. That's even more complicated. Why would I make a new drug just to do that? I want to teach people how to not get cancer in the first place. And that entails making yourselves happy and healthy today. So you're going to feel like a fucking boss when you're living day to day, optimize every fucking second you're alive. Cause you only have one life in this body, in this meat suit, mm-hmm. you know, like I, I'm very spiritual. Like, I don't, I, I don't know if this is the, the end of it for the body, for the, the soul within, Yeah. but regardless, it's all you got with this one body. Now you better love it. You better thrive. So I want to help people thrive using their genes, but in a holistic context. Yeah. Crazy to hear how your own personal experience, something that you just never considered. Once you found that out, I mean, it it probably just radically changed the way that you looked at it, kind of as you described. And then it led you down this path to be like, okay, how can I work to solve this problem? If it's, if I've had such a big issue with this, there's got to be other people too that have had this issue. And you've obviously experienced that with your clients. Like you've said, you had some crazy successes too, right? Describe that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I've had, and you know, I... Like I said, I'll never be that guy saying I magically yeah. cure everybody, but yeah. I have had – there's a spectrum. I've had clients, every disease, every improvement, everyone falls on a spectrum because we're all so infinitely complex as bio-individual beings. But yeah. I've had some people I work with, let's just say chronic fatigue or depression or anxiety their whole life. They've seen a bunch of doctors. Some of them within a day, two, three days, even a day, day one, I feel in their words cured – like you cured me and that's, you know, that's obviously a hyper responder. That's very, very, that, you know, sure. the, don't get me wrong. That's not the typical within one day, you know, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. that shows to me and based on their genes, they had a bunch of compounding mutations that made their baseline production in their cells so low, regardless of their lifestyle or diet or sunlight, it was just that low. They had that much distance that they could improve upon. Then you have people that usually it's in a couple of weeks, they feel significantly better um, and then you have some people that, you know, after a month or two together, we tweak the supplements a little bit, some diet recommendations, the blood work improves a bit, but you know, maybe they're only 25, 30% better. And then I sadly have to say, I think that there might be something else going on, meaning some non-genetic factor Well, not direct genetic factor, but I can look at the genes and say, you, you have a higher chance of accumulating mercury. There's specific genes that make you accumulate more of mercury versus lead versus arsenic. So then I could ask them, do you eat a lot of seafood? Yes, I eat a lot of seafood. Okay. So not only do you eat a lot of seafood, so you're exposing yourself to more iron, but you also retain, I mean, sorry, more mercury. You also retain more mercury than the average person. So maybe you should go get an HTMA hair mineral test heavy metal test to check that out. Am I an expert to analyze that for you? No, but I do point them in the right direction Mm. because I'm just one guy. 
the key to true health is having a team of multidisciplinary people. But the people, like I said, a lot of them, most of them that work with me, they're like, oh my God, like, thank you. They're so grateful for that 20, 30%. You know, they're, they're ecstatic about it because they're used to just getting yeah. nothing out of it. But I used to beat myself up. I used to beat myself up a lot thinking that like, being a perfectionist that I need to help everyone hundred percent with all of their stuff or I'm a failure, but I'm realizing that's not, I can't, if I'm like that, I will never be happy, you know? Yeah, for sure. Interesting. Yeah. And I mean, you make this, this good point and um, I actually think you put out one of the clips that I made that, that spoke about this, but everyone's complex. Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone is going to have a completely. Oh yeah. That was a great post. Great post. Yeah, yeah, right up no, my alley. I had to share that one. Let's go. Let's go. Um, but everyone's going to respond differently to, uh, different environmental factors and they're going to have, like you said, maybe a higher level of histamine or a different mutation in a gene that will make them react differently to something or they just can't get enough vitamin A or vitamin D or whatever it is. And even the, vit the vitamin D thing is one of those just like low hanging fruit things yeah. that I can't remember the exact statistics, but I mean, the United States by, by and large is chronically deficient yeah. in, in vitamin D. It's a, it's crazy. And it's one of those things that is such an easy supplement, such a low hanging fruit that you would think like, man, we should be shouting this to the rooftops. Like everyone should be checking this out and making sure that we're getting enough vitamin D. And some of those things are so simple and you've probably had those. It's like these simple things that people just don't realize that if we could tweak these, they could have a radically better quality of life. And like you've said, you've, you've encountered that to a large extent. And then also the other thing that is interesting is you pointed out this, this personalized medicine and this, this kind of, this, this push that you've done where you really want to look at everyone as an individual that could have a different set of genes in this, in, with this mutation and how that's going to affect their overall health. And this, this personalized medicine push, do you think that the U.S. healthcare system will push into this more as a model? Because it seems like a logical thing to do where you have um, a more personalized approach to medicine. What do you think about that? Yeah, so um... – yeah, so I definitely think that um, they will lean into this. However, it'll be done a little bit differently. Okay. They're gonna like I know a company called Genomind that they're doing genetic sequencing to figure out which type of pharmaceuticals would be best for your mental health disorder. So yep. they're not gonna let go of these drugs. They're not letting go of the pharmaceuticals. But something called uh, pharmacogenomics is. You, you the, the the proteins that break down your pharmaceutical drugs can be mutated. So you can have people that metabolize drugs much faster or much slower. Um, I personally, and I, I noticed this going back, you know, I, I, I'm a big raver, I love electronic music and everything. And yeah. um, whenever I'm out at raves, people are taking some shit. Who are the always the most fucked up types of people? It's always African Americans and Asians. They're always... Very, very sensitive. Even if you're just boozing, you know, mo mo or drinking, yeah. and that's because the prevalence of mutations in these proteins and genes that break down these drugs are much higher in those populations. So they break it down much, much slower. I think the mutations in those enzymes matters much more than body weight for most drugs. So um, pharmacogenomics is figuring out there can be an eightfold swing. So the same person, the same weight, can need eight times more drugs to get the same effect as another person. So pharmacogenomics wow. is figuring out how well or how not well you metabolize the drugs to personalize your starting dose. You don't wanna start them too high based on their genes, then it'll be side effects. You don't wanna start them too low based on their genes for too long, they'll spend weeks and months suffering, not getting the results. So I do think the personalized medicine is undeniable. It's gonna make the drugs better, um, I just have no faith that they're going to adopt the holistic aspect of it um, yeah. because it's just really – there's no money in that for them. There's no yeah. there's no money in that and you know, again, we do need big pharma in certain scenarios but I – yeah, I don't think – and that, it's a big problem too because the biggest issue with the holistic space is that it's all out of pocket. It's not covered by insurance and that makes it very, very expensive. Um, you know, we put in a lot of time to make a lot of sacrifices to get our education, put in a lot of hours self-educating and stuff, you know, and it's, I personally struggled. Um, I'm used to being a student and just working, working, working. And I struggled initially trying to set boundaries because I was finding myself researching a question someone asked me at like midnight on like a Tuesday. 
And like, it fucks up my sleep schedule that I feel like shit the yep. next day. And it's like, I'm doing all that for free. But, you know, they're paying for the first thing, but it's like, where do you draw the line there? But also the whole medical establishment to begin with, there's no more really small own your own practice. They're all bought out by big hospital chains. They have to see so many patients. Like they get like 15 minutes per patient because they have to keep the ball rolling to see all their patients. So I always say, don't hate the player, hate the game. It's the training system. And who initially funded the training system? I think ages ago, like decades ago, I think it was like the Rockefellers or something that funded – the people that were making the pharmaceutical drugs funded the training system that we're still using today to tell doctors, X symptom, give Y test to prescribe Z drug. That's all it's about. There's no looking deep forward at all. But even it's going off of that again, even the holistic space, think about this. Doctors are trained and pharmacists are trained on interactions of drugs no one's trained on the interactions of supplements and there's no oversight for that i see so many of my clients come to me more anxious uh higher insomnia anemic hair falling out because they're on the wrong types of supplements and another holistic practitioner put them on that the one example i always give that's very easy to grasp curcumin you ever heard of that curcumin or turmeric yeah Yeah, Yeah, very very good Mm anti-inflammatory I used to use it when I was figuring out my inflammation. It would make me feel so good. It would remove my inflammation. I use it here and there. I don't need it that much anymore because I don't have the inflammation to begin with. Everyone markets it as arthritis or brain health or gut health. But people don't know it also chelates iron and minerals out of your body. So Mm. I've had women come to me, hair falling out. And they're on this crazy curcumin supplement, crazy liposomal curcumin. Their practitioner, their holistic naturopath put them on. And they're severely anemic. Their iron levels will not raise up. Well, no shit. You're taking a liposomal iron chelator. I've never seen curcumin ever marketed ever as an iron chelator supplement. Or it actually can also raise adrenaline in your body. So I'm sensitive to adrenaline raising. So I I can get overstimulation and anxiety on it. And it's never marketed for that. It's only marketed for that one mechanism. So it's, it's not even just, and that's what really bothers me. It's one thing to give people what the cells need, but I'm telling you, man, a lot of low hanging fruit is getting people off the wrong supplements that aren't interacting with their body favorably. Interesting. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. But yeah, the supplement industry is just not regulated at all in the same way. No, but it's hard though, because what do you want to do? What are you going to say? You can't go buy supplements off vitamin shop. That's very, yeah. then yeah. everyone will be up in arms. You know, they're taking away our supplements. I'd probably be pissed yeah. too, but it's like, I actually just made a, I had a whole rant on my story today about this. And I was trying to figure out like, if you're a professional, health professional practitioner, doing it for a living, suggesting natural supplements to people. I think there should be some sort of basic training you have to pass. Now, at the same point, if someone wants to go into vitamin shop with no guidance and buy whatever they want, your body, your choice. I think that's uh, that's my philosophy. I think that should apply across the board to anything and everything. But if you're taking expert advice from a professional, but then it's also like it's – there's a lot of politics too because then how many supplement companies would lobby against that because they just want to sell their stuff. So it's – I don't even know how you would navigate that. But I must say – the wrong supplements is huge. And you mentioned the vitamin D before. A lot of the holistic community is against vitamin D. They say your body can make it. It's a hormone. You don't need it. Too much of it will calcify your tissues. You can. I have a mutation. No matter how much sunlight I get, I will never make enough vitamin D. I was in the beach every day, super low vitamin D. So people that – I've had a lot of people come to me, severe autoimmune issues, yeah. and they have all these mutations affecting vitamin D, how their cells activate it, transport it. How they how how much the cells are actually responsive to it. Your blood levels may say seventy. Your cells may only be responding if it's forty, based on a mutation. So interesting, right? It's mind blowing. And yeah. you have people that are saying people are fear mongered. They're scared shitless. Vitamin D? No, I can't take that. I'm like, try it. Five ten thousand I use for a month and get blood work done. If you really think mm. two little soft gels of vitamin D for a month are going to ruin your health, I don't know what to tell you, man. You know what I mean? Like it, it, it's. Yeah. Give it a shot and 99% of the time, it's night and day difference because that's what their cells needed and they were fear-mongered out of it. Yeah, and they wouldn't know that if they hadn't, well, A, tried it, but then B, also, you know the mechanism behind it. You can actually see the mutations behind it, which is something that you wouldn't get when you go to the doctor and you're having symptoms. It just – it would never even come up and yet that was a massive – that's basically the underlying reason for it. Man, that's so interesting. Yeah, so like I take vitamin D. I take a a number of different supplements, but – 
without looking at my genes, there's a good chance that some of them that are, are interacting in a negative way potentially. Uh, so or... it, 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 it's hard to, so I think the main, the main issues I see would be, I mentioned the adrenaline type stuff. So if you don't feel anxious on edge or short with people like day to day, I wouldn't stress about that. Um, if you feel good throughout the day, that's what I like to tell people. I always, at the end of the day, I always go off symptoms first and always, even yeah, if, even yeah. if the genes, Sometimes I'll have five genes point to one supplement someone needs. They try it. They feel worse. And you know what? That's fine. I would say that's you know less than 10% of the time. But sure, sure. at the end of the day, as much as we know about the genes, there's a shit ton more we don't know. So if mm -hmm. if so, the platform I use has 100 information on 100 million genes. Out of those 100 million, we only know what a fraction of them actually do right now. So I, I'm doing all this information with what we have now. So if I have three genes that are saying this works for you, for all we know, 10 years from now, there could be 40 other mutations that we learn about that explain why, even though that said it was good for you, it really wasn't. It's all about a net benefit, pros versus cons yeah. for any supplement. Because yeah. I could find you – give me any supplement. I could find mechanisms and fear monger you out of taking it. Oh, sure. If you look hard yeah. enough, you could always find something potentially negative about anything. And that's what drives me nuts about Instagram nowadays. Like eat liver every day. It's so good. I've oh, seen, yeah. I've seen so many people – have copper toxicity, vitamin A toxicity, because you have it every day. But for some people, they're copper deficient, iron deficient, and it's perfectly good for them. So mm -hmm. these people that say any one, if they say any one good, any one thing is perfect for everybody or what everyone needs, or if they say any one molecule is bad for everyone, I think it's just yeah. some clown shit. Like it's like that. Yeah. That's it's it's far far more nuanced than that. That should be the litmus test right there. Like the, whenever you go to these absolute absolutes, and I think of like Liver King, yeah. And I'm trying to think of an equivalent on the the vegan side. But regardless, whenever you have these absolutes, instantly I get skeptical, and I think everyone should yeah. because they're just. I'm not saying that there aren't certain individuals that don't genuinely benefit from a more let's just say extreme version of a diet they might they're actually might and, and the regarding the extreme diets too I, I definitely see the usage the more extreme the diet the shorter the duration it should be like i personally okay. if i had to pick between carnivore and veganism i personally think carnivore is healthier for more people that being said though for gut healing for a couple of months or so going meat free elimination diet vegan for some people works some people carnivore works some people keto can work and while the data isn't like the, the information I have about what works for anxiety or depression, that data is far more established than what diets work. So that's still – that's called nutrigenomics. Definitely a much more newer emerging field. Um, but I love being all natural with stuff because so I could I – could, I can have this crazy hypothesis, connect all these dots that no one's ever heard of before and say, hey, this supplement might be good for you. You try it and what's the worst case scenario? It does nothing. Maybe you get a little anxious for a day and don't sleep good for one night, or maybe you get a little tummy ache for a couple of hours. And then whoop de doo, it's not for you. You wasted thirty bucks. Which in the grand scheme, yeah. when people are paying forty thousand dollars, I've had people say to me they drop six figures on tests and shit for over the past year or two. They work with me and I figure I, I figure out what the root cause is, because you're taking all these other tests. That's why I love genes, because genetic testing, you're always gonna get answers. You are never going to not have a mutation. You could take all these yeast tests, functional labs, all these things and get nothing to come up. You'll always have mutations. No one doesn't have mutations. The question is, which ones do you try to address? Because at the end of the day, you'll sure. always have mutations that aren't supplemented around. You know, you can never – you can only take so many supplements. Like I don't like having people on more than maybe 10 different products, but the products I use are mostly isolates because I don't like the – crazy 20 product herbal liver detox blend because that's more herbs with more mechanisms that can clash with your genes. That's why I like doing one, eat most of the products I use are just the magnesium or just the vitamin D or just like that. Yeah. So, but I see people taking 15 different mega herb, this and that, whatever. I feel off. I'm like, I don't even know what the fuck is doing what. And then they come off of them. They can't even get out of bed. They're so depressed because that's how much it was affecting their neurotransmitters, these natural herbs. It's crazy. Wow. Man, that is crazy. Sheesh. Um, but yeah, you also pointed out too that like you'll use – okay, so everyone has mutations. But then at the end of the day – so they might one, – one way you could put this is they might point you in a particular direction. But 
just because they point in a particular direction doesn't mean that that person is going to respond favorably. Now, they might, so there's a good chance that you might want to go down that way and try it. But at the end of the day, it matters how the person feels. And you would say that's kind of like, I don't know, your final rule or kind of like your, your main your yep. main test. At the end of the day, if it's not working for them, well, you pointed out there's still a lot we don't know. Yep. So we got to go with what the patient actually feels. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I got to say, you know, I'd say at least nine out of ten times it ends up lining up pretty well. But again, okay. for some people, any supplement or drug you start, you have the honeymoon phase where you're, you're here and you're like, holy shit. And then it wears off a little bit. You know, anything, mm-hmm. any, anything you, you hyper respond, then it wears down a little bit. You're still yeah. better than where you were. Mm-hmm. It's not that initial. Imagine your first cup of coffee. Like you, you build a ton, Your cells get used to that. But oh, yeah. Some people, you know, will have like six or seven things. We start them all out and they're like, I don't know what the fuck just happened today. I was way over the top. I'm like, okay, let's pull it back. Let's do these two sure. for four days. Then add it in, you know, but everyone is different. Now, do I think all the supplements can be incorporated safely together? Of course, like safety wise. But again, some people have very sensitive nervous systems, whether it's genetics some people also have a mold toxicity or parasites or this or that. And that's something I'm not an expert in, but I want to learn more about it because I do think a lot of people have these other infections, but I'm biased here, of course, but I think starting with the genes first, because it's so black and white, even if you only get 20, if I could tell someone before you start doing this crazy four month parasite detox, I can make you feel 25% better in a week. Who wouldn't want to go and do that? And here's another catch yeah. too. I worked with a lot of people, even some health coaches that are experts in mold detox, and they've been consistently getting mold over and over and over again. They'll detox it, get it again. Detox it, get it again. Hmm. That's because they, most of the time they have mutations in how their body hmm. produces glutathione, methylates, which is involved in detoxification. So even though their protocols work to get rid of the mold – you're always going to come across mold yeah. spores. Like you're never going to avoid all to- – you can't live in fear about toxins. Our body is meant to break these down and detoxify them. But if that's heavily mutated, you're going to – they call it canary in a coal mine. You're going to be the sickest one out of all your friends all the time. Everyone has that one friend that's just always fucking sick. But you're in yeah. similar environments. In my opinion, that has to be due to genetics. So in that case, they work with me. We get them on the right supplements. Then they do one more detox and then they're like, oh my God, now I feel great. And they stay feeling good because now it's not even like you're supercharging their cells. You're just bringing their cells up to where they should be. Your cells should have a certain level of resiliency, but also the toxic load of the world is also increasing. So part of it's the increased toxic load, but I really would love to do a study and I don't know how the fuck you would do this, but the pe- let's say the people that get heavy metal poisoning. What percentage of them have mutations in heavy metal detox genes? Yeah. Like how many of them are really the dosage of the poison is that high and they're not even mutated? I think personally the vast, vast majority of people that get mold have mutations affecting mold. Heavy metals, they have uh, mutations affecting heavy metals. Parasites, yeah. et cetera. Because like if they're the weakest links, why wouldn't the weakest links be the ones most likely to get clinically sick from these things? Interesting. Yeah, so it almost is like those those things are interesting hints that they may they probably have some kind of genetic mutation thing underlying it. And yet, before I really heard about like what you do, I I'd never really heard of it. Like it was it was kind of a novel concept to me. And I remember Harley describing it. I'm like, man, this makes so much sense that this is a to- this is an area that like we just don't focus it at all. It seems like we just don't focus on it. And yet it can have these massive effects or it might not too. It depends on the individual. They may be, like you said, uh, allergic to mice yep. and you happen to be around them all the time. Yep. That's yeah. That's so interesting. Um, so part of this whole holistic thing too, there's this element of like preventative care and like trying to make your body as resilient and robust as you can. And I feel like we've in at least the American healthcare system, it feels like we typically treat symptoms in a disease Mm -hmm. we don't do much with preventative care and i've looked at some numbers and i don't have them in front of me but catching for example cancer early and i know you said you worked with breast cancer catching breast cancer early in an earlier stage dramatically increases your chances of actually getting rid of it and getting into remission and what do you think about this preventative 
care model and should we move more towards that? Absolutely. I'll take it one step further too. Uh. Pretty much no one ever dies of breast cancer unless it metastasizes. Okay. Because if you think about it, metastasis means it goes to another organ in the body. And yep. the, the benefit of breast cancer, I mean, this isn't really a benefit, but relative to other cancers, relative to brain cancer, let's say, breast cancer is very superficial. It's on the breasts. So if you find it before it metastasizes, this is definitely a horrible procedure I wouldn't wish on any woman, but sure. you remove the breast with a double mastectomy. And then as long as the cancer hasn't entered the bloodstream or went anywhere else, the cancer's gone. But the problem is, is that most cancers are found stage three or stage four. My thesis work literally was investigating how do breast cancer cells start metastasizing out of the breast? If we could stop mm -hmm. that, you'll buy them more time to detect it earlier. And then if you could catch it before it metastasizes, you can go in and remove it. That's why things like pancreatic cancer are so deadly. It doesn't show symptoms until it's all over your body. Yeah, or like a brain tumor, for example. It, you want, or like skin cancer. They, that's very easy, superficial to see. They cut it out and you're good to go. But if it starts in your brain, that's a very bad prognosis. But like a skin cancer, a breast cancer, those are very superficial. So if you catch them earlier, they're very easy to remove. Um, I personally think, you know, we've all heard the stories of they have a golden pill for cancer locked away. Um, I think that's a bunch of bullshit as a cancer biologist. Um, yeah. Everyone's cancer is so unique. Even five people with the same subtype of lung cancer, even within one tumor, you can have 10 different subpopulations of cancer cells, all with different genetics within one person's tumor, wow. let alone different wow. people's tumors. And each of them can respond differently to drugs. So if you think about it, let's just say you have five different genetic subtypes of cancer cells in there. Mm -hmm. You hit them with radiation. You kill off two of them. Well, the three you didn't kill off, now we're going to take up one third of the tumor now each. And now they're going to be resistant to that. And then you hit them with, so how many other things you have to hit them with to make sure you kill all the cancer cells? So I think that we're not going to have a magic bullet cure to treat cancer. It's going to come in an early diagnosis. I think in the next five to eight years, you're going to take a urine test once a year. It's going to test you for 15 different cancer types. And that's actually partially what I studied too. Those little exosomes I mentioned earlier, the little messengers that cells send out, cancer cells send them out too in the blood. And they hold different things than a regular healthy cell exosome. So those are highly concentrated in the blood and in the urine and in bodily fluid. So that means okay. you can – this is what I was trying to do. If you can identify what cargo is unique to a cancer cell exosome and you can detect that tiny amount in the like – we know what's in them. It's more so the sensitivity threshold, like how many exosomes are in the, in the urine to test. But as you get better at that, you kind of get what I'm saying here. You'll be able to see, oh, what do you know? You have the exosomes in your urine of stage one pancreatic cancer. If they found stage one or even stage two pancreatic cancer and they opened you, the problem is they have to open you up and go and look. They're not just going to cut you open every year just to cut you open and check. But if they yeah. know that and go and check, they'll find it, they'll take it out, and you're pretty much cured. They're going to take out a little extra area of the pancreas to make sure there's nothing left there. The surgical teams are much – they're good. They, they, know, they know to not leave any cancer there. But the hardest part, again, is finding it Find early, early enough. But again, yeah. now coming back to what I do, things like methylation. Everyone's heard of the MTHFR gene, homocysteine. That's that raised by inflammation. High homocysteine is directly linked to many different types of cancers. Low vitamin D is directly linked to a lot of different types of cancers. Low glutathione is linked to many different types of cancers. Those are just three of many, but three I mentioned there, all three of those have very commonly are mutated, so they don't work as well in the normal healthy cell. So you're telling me that if we knew that and started at age, I don't know, 25 or 30, we started supplementing and supporting those pathways. There's no clinical studies to show this, but just think intuitively here. If we're yeah. supporting all the Achilles heels of your cells throughout your whole life, why would that not help? People think of BRCA mutations, you know, like the, like the really bad cancer mutations. I'm thinking of the regular mutations that make us not feel good right now lead to our cancers later on in life. Eventually. Interesting. Yeah, and if you could just take those out, I mean, out of the equation. In the sense exactly. Of ahead of the game, what would that do? That's such a fascinating thing. And again, back to vitamin D, it's such a low-hanging fruit that you would think that we would 
we would push more into this. So well, no, because then no. Well, I mean, well, you know, if you're if you're doing more vitamin D, then you're going to have less autoimmunity, less mood disorders, less chronic pain. So you know why they wouldn't want to be pushing that because it's all about yeah. the money, you know. And and it's yeah. it's and again, I don't mean to bash physicians. But like a lot of them are good people trying to do well. There's awful definitely there's definitely a lot of fucking shit bags too. But that's any sector, you know. But it's more so the training community, and this is why I love I got a PhD. The PhD trained me to critically think, and that's what is severely. They don't want doctors to critically think. Most of the innovation is driven by PhDs, but they want you to stay in your lane, especially in the big pharma area, in the biotech area. Um, that's why I'm trying to figure out how to, you know, make this blow up and just make it completely undeniable. Yeah. No, that's interesting. And yeah, there, there's an incentive problem in the American healthcare system for sure. And it's it's tricky to know, you know, if there's an obvious way to, to fix it. I don't necessarily think there's an obvious way to fix it because – yeah, I mean, essentially, they make a lot of their money off the fact of you being sick yep. and having to go back again and again and again to keep buying that pill. If you eliminate the cause for that pill, eliminate the cause yeah. for that SSRI through you know, a, a more holistic means yeah. or through a supplementation of vitamin D, well, that's not going to make any money. Yeah. So I mean, the, 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 you... the, the supplement company will be making money, which is like cool, sure. but at the same point, sure. you know, that's, that's, that's not patent protected. You know, there's yeah. not going to be one... No. high entity that's gonna be able to do that yeah interesting interesting and back to this whole holistic thing you mentioned you were big in like weightlifting in college is that kind of yeah thing? i mean still am i mean every yeah, every day yeah, yeah 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 no it's huge i've noticed just from a from a mental health perspective i've noticed massive increases absolutely in overall mood just from lifting weights and that seems also just like a a no-brainer one how often do you incorporate that into like if, if you're seeing people and they're coming to you is that always like something that you pretty much always recommend like man get in the gym yeah or yeah some kind of physical exercise it seems like a pretty rational thing to recommend definitely i like to tell people bare minimum just getting some walking in you know okay. it, it's like right now i don't do like i definitely have the not i've been bodybuilding for like 12 years sure. now more actually so like i have the knowledge to do that but then it's also like the more if I do every aspect of coaching for each person, I'm yeah. barely going to have any clients. And, you know, it's going to be an expensive packet. You know what I mean? Because you can only spread yourself so thin. Um, but even regarding the weight training, that I respond so well to weight training because it raises something in your brain called BDNF. That's what helps grow new brain cells. That's what helps your brain respond to change. I actually have a mutation, so I don't produce as much normally. So sunlight, intense exercise oh. – psychedelics, all raise BDNF. And what are three things that I love? Intense exercise, sunlight, and psychedelics. Yeah. So CBD does it as well. Uh, magnesium does it. Uh, uh, fasting does it. Saunas, cold plunge. All these yep. good biohacks, people yep. say, enhance your livelihood, your, your sense of well-being. It's mediated by BDNF. I, and stress lowers BDNF. I think that the stress-related lowering of BDNF from lifestyle, I think for most people – that is the most significant factor in their depression or anxiety. Now, again, going back to the canvas idea, you can still have a BDNF issue with a serotonin genetic issue. Yeah. Or could be inflammation that. also lowers serotonin production. So you could have – think about – So all right. So if we're all the way up here right now, a normal person with no mutations in serotonin stuff at all. So let's just say they have a mutation. The enzyme that makes serotonin is mutated. It only works half as well. Sure. On top of that – they have low vitamin D, which lowers the expression of this enzyme. So it's down even more. Double whammy. Then they also have high histamine in their brain. That lowers the expression even more. Yep. Uh, I'm trying to think of any other ones. Then they also have inflammation, which will lower the expression even more. So you see how it's, it, it's always very complex multifactorial. Think of it like a pie chart because like just one supplement is not going to fix everything. But Certainly. if you address the vitamin D and that helps – 12%. You fix your histamine. That helps 14%. I'm throwing out numbers here, but you get what I'm saying there. You yeah, support the all these individual things. Then of course you need to be moving your body. But the thing I like to tell people too is a lot of people are very run down, exhausted, fatigued, just sick of like life. Not even necessarily suicidal way. Just sick of like, oh, another fucking day at the job I hate, blah, blah, blah. No energy. 
you can't just be a wellness guy and say, go outside and exercise and do a fucking cold plunge because people don't have energy to do that. But mm. I'm not saying supplements outwork a bad lifestyle. They never will. But those supplements can give someone that instant energy and they may say, all right, I'm going to go for a walk now. I have that. Mm-hmm. Ooh, I took that. Be- I took, I, I didn't, I didn't change my diet at all yet. All I did was take these vitamins that made me feel a little more energetic. Now I might go do something. Exactly. It can help get that started. The catalyst. Huge. Exactly. Yeah. And a lot of people, yeah. a lot of people, most people will never be like a holistic biohacker, whatever. I think a lot of people in the holistic space, they look at people too idealistically. You have to meet mm. people with where they're at. Some people are complete couch sure. potatoes. They probably always will be fairly sedentary no matter what you tell them. But mm. what's the lesser evil? Giving them the multivitamin, giving them the vitamin D, getting them moving, getting them to walk four days a week for 10 minutes or like an hour of walking per week. Yeah. They lose they lose 25 pounds. They're still significantly overweight, but they lost 25 pounds. They feel better, and that's good enough for them. You know, not mm-hmm. everyone wants to go all the way down, you know, high level, crushing life, doing all these. Some people just want to not have knee pain to play with their kids, and that is totally fine. I think Gary Vee said, Mm -hmm. if you're, if you're happy, you're winning. Mm -hmm. So as long as you're happy with where your life is at, I have no advice to give you because it's your life. But I think a lot of people, they're not sick enough for the doctor to tell them they have to go to a hospital, but they're far from thriving. And my job is to focus on the regular Joe Schmo that is anxious, low energy, you know, whatever, and help bring them up to a higher frequency, help them live a more thriving life. And then they're probably going to be loving it so much. They're going to want to help others as well. Yeah. No, I know what you mean. Um, I tend to have a bit of a idealistic view too. I'm yep. like, man, it's, do these, you know, do these six things, hit that cold plunge every yeah, day. Cause it's, it's easy and, for us because we're yeah. used to, we're used to, I like to tell people too, you need to feel what normal feels like. If you could feel what I feel like for one day, you would be like, what fucking drugs is he on? Sign me the fuck up. Because yep. once yep. you know what that feels like, you get addicted. Why do it. you think we're so why do you think I travel with all these bags of powder and pills and blah blah blah? I bring my eye covers, I bring my blue blockers, I bring yep. my earplugs, yep. I bring all of this. Because I feel like I feel like some days I feel like manic. I feel too good sometimes. And I gotta be like, I'll tell my wife, like. Tell me something shitty right now. Just, just bring me back to reality right now. Like, like it's just, it's just today is just, and, and, and then the problem is it's, I got to get to bed and I'm not wired in a bad way, not stemmed out, but like, I'm not ready for bed. Cause I have, you know, I'm taking she legit, a good multivitamin, this, that. And it's like, I have all this energy. You can have an abundance, excess of energy without being anxious. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, yeah, I know what you mean. I'm just going, yeah. going, going. I want to keep going, but you also got to prioritize the sleep. So that's why I take like my nighttime stack. I take CBD or CBN oil, Mm -hmm. magnesium L3 and 8. It gets to your brain much better than other types. Um, Glycine. And then I do melatonin right before bed because I have mutations and how my body secretes melatonin at nighttime. Oh, okay. And my cells are less sensitive to melatonin. Interesting. But I break down melatonin slower than normal. So I take one fifth of the dose my wife does. Otherwise, I'm groggy as fuck the next day. Yeah. Interesting. My wife's what? I got a hundred pounds on my wife, and she takes five times the melatonin dose, and she wakes up bouncing out of. She's I'm more groggy than her in the morning, and she takes five times the melatonin dose that I do, weighing a hundred pounds less. That's the power of genetic mutations, and just and just the power of the fact that we're all unique individuals. Yeah, there's no no one size fits all. But right, random random plug here. But yeah, I literally have a I have a cold plunge in my closet. So awesome. I'm I'm that guy, and we have we have friends come over, and we always encourage. Do them. you have one like the you actual? Guys, do you have like a garbage bucket? Or you have an actual like the actual like tub one that they have. I know there's a couple well, different brands. Well, so you can buy them. We made our own. Nice. So we took. Uh, I just I found a YouTube video. It's just like it's a chest freezer sealed the inside okay. with yep. silicone, yep. 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 and then hooked up just like a temperature controlled module, so it'll turn it off and on based upon the temperature of the water inside. Gotcha. So hey, it works pretty good, but it's a lot of fun. And um, most people think we're crazy, but I'm like, man, dude, if you could just experience the feeling that you feel after you get out of that cold plunge, I mean, you'd know why. It's addicting. It's yep. incredible. Yep. It's incredible. So those those biohacking things are pretty cool. Yeah, um, I'm actually gonna, I actually want to get a uh, – I'm going to order an infra, infrared sauna soon for my house. Yeah. Um, oh, I just, awesome. I'm, I'm in New York now, and I just feel so – 
I have a mutation in lower BDNF, which sunlight helps mm-hmm. raise. I also have mutations in nitrous oxide, nitric oxide, which sunlight helps raise. So that's why I, my normal production is lower. So when I get in the sun, I notice that increase much more. And I'm in New York now. So it's, it's really outdoor weather, maybe three months out of the year. So like, I want to get one for now. I've done the regular saunas. I used to go to my old gym a lot, but I haven't been been to that gym in a while. My gym I go to now doesn't have it, but I want to try the infrared because I actually just saw I was at a biohacking conference and reading the benefits of that specifically the infrared is really just incredible, just on so many different fronts. Just, we're, we're meant to download the energy from the sun, not just for vitamin D purposes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, more than just that. Yeah, sauna is huge. Love in the sauna. Um, do you do much with intermittent fasting? Have you experimented? So, that? yeah. So, I it was a couple of years ago, I did, I did deep keto with intermittent fasting. And anyone yep. that knows me, like, like a bodybuilder. So every three, four hours I'm eating, I always eat clean food. Um, but you know, I eat like, I eat not a crazy amount for how big I am, I guess, but like, you know, to a regular person, you're eating again, you know, it's just, yeah. but I did deep keto. I was doing like 16 to 20 hour fast every day effortlessly, which for me is like unheard of. The only way I could do that was doing keto. The second I would have carbohydrates, my hunger would be unleashed. I felt so incredible day after day i i would be i would be like soaring i'd feel myself losing some energy i would have a spoonful of coconut oil and be like stimmed up again and i'm like this is hour 19 and like my fat ass is like getting away with doing just a scoop of the coconut oil it was incredible but i ended up not i ended up stopping just because it took it takes my body a very long time to go into ketosis so Mm. i'll like suffer feeling like shit for weeks or once I got into it, most people, they just fast and then boom, they're back into it. It took me a very long time, mm. just hard to stick with. But I did realize yeah. I think it'd be very, very powerful. I do think though, especially for women, I don't think people should be fasting every single day, especially okay. women. Um, I think it'd just be harsh on the body, but everyone's different depending on the activity levels. I was also okay. doing hardcore high intensity bodybuilder training in a hoodie every day. So keto may not be the best, you know, if you're just doing a little mm. uh, distance training, maybe it could be better. Um, but I, re- I do think a lot of the benefits of keto though and carnivore are simply removing processed foods and grains. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I, now I'll go, glu- I'm totally gluten free. Gluten fucks me up a lot neurologically. Um, and you get like brain fog. Like, yeah. I get brain yeah, fog, yeah. fatigue, lethargy, just, I don't feel like crushing it. And normally I am go, go, go all the time. And yeah. I, it's just same thing with histamine foods. And it's like, I have all the genes for celiac disease, but I've never gotten GI issues. So people are so hung up on celiac, gluten, gut issue. And I'm like, it is an inflammatory irritant that just like histamine can appear in any organ. So inflammation from gluten or histamine can cause joint issues, rheumatoid arthritis, joint pain, uh, hives, eczema, rashes if it's the skin. Brain fog, lethargy, insomnia, anxiety, depression, if it's the brain, uh, you know, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, if it's in the gut. So it's like any organ system can be affected by these different inflammatory things. So um, I have mutations where I'm highly sensitive. My, my immune cells recognize gluten as like public enemy number one. I think pretty much everyone has some inflammatory response to gluten, but mine is genetically intensified. So I tell people though, I eat so much white rice and potatoes, roasted potatoes, and white rice is good as shit. Like people act like it's so hard to go gluten free. Just skip the fucking breads. But like white rice, delicious. Potatoes, delicious. I'll have like rice or organic corn, like gluten free pasta. It tastes fucking great. And I feel very clear headed all the time, but Mm. Even me personally now, I've never been a very high carb type of person. Um, I'm 6'3", 230 right now, and I have maybe 150, 200 grams of carbs a day doing like high intensity bodybuilder training, which it's not low carb, but it's definitely more moderate, lowish yeah. sort of For what you're doing. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And that's how I feel yeah. the best. You know, if I have a crazy hard leg workout for an hour and a half, I can't walk. Like, I'll eat a shit. T- I'll eat 300 grams of white rice. I can tell my body needs it, and it soaks mm-hmm. it up like a sponge. But that's also due to years of doing this and knowing my body. You know, like a lot of people will see me 
on the weekend or something, we're going out or whatever, I'm picking out on this crazy food. And I'm like, you don't realize I'll time my refeed days and stuff around when I know I'm going to be out with people. Like I don't always catch me like on a normal day. I'm yeah. not, eat, I'm not yeah. eating like tilapia and rice. You know, I'll eat like, I love like ground beef uh, with white rice and some veggies, a little bit of ketchup or like some roasted chicken with some pasta. Like I don't do like, you know, little morsels or whatever. I'm not a bodybuilder. I'm not prepping for a show. Cause I think that in of itself is so bad for your hormones and your body. I can never do that. I'm, I'm a fat boy at heart. Like I, I need to eat. And like, I, I'm one of those people I need to, I was fat growing up and I need to, oh. I need to diet. I need to diet hard and be doing like fasted sprints every morning to like have my six pack and stuff. And it's like, I'm not one of those people that eats whatever. And it's just shredded. Like I, yeah, I, I build, work for it. I'm like an endomorph. I build muscle easy, but I also gain fat somewhat easy. Mm, um, yeah. but it's applying these scientific principles throughout the years. I tell people, I swear to God, my genetics are not that good for like body composition or body. Building. Like what? No way. I'm like, I've been actively researching, learning, applying these principles for over the past dozen years at this point. So it cumulatively does that, you know? Yeah, man. Such a such an interesting, interesting thing to kind of discover, like what you respond to, what you don't respond to well, how to tailor that, all the nuance there. And I mean, that's just kind of like, it's so fascinating. It's kind of an endless discussion too, like where, where you can go down that road too. Um, so I kind of want to switch gears here because I really sure. want to ask you this. Um, okay, so I've looked a lot into genetic engineering and kind of the future in terms of where we're going and ever since we you know discovered CRISPR and and figured out how to do gene editing I always was fascinated by the implications about what this would mean down the road yep. because there are some some obvious ones that I think are like yes this makes sense this is great there are a number of different diseases that are primarily or only caused by genes yep. and Eliminating those seems like a smart move, seems like something that we would all want to reduce human suffering. But what gets more tricky is, is what happens when you can, you know, pick how smart your kid is going to be or pick how strong you want them to be. And then what happens because we know that there's going to be a minority of wealthy people that get access to this technology yep. first. This is just the way that capitalism, this is the way that innovation works. And what happens then when you have a different class of citizens that are genetically modified. Have you ever seen the movie Gattaca? Yep. Chance? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's yep. the same concept. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, it's fascinating to me. And again, there's, there's a, there's amazing things coming down the road. Like there's some incredible things getting rid of, um, different genetically modified disease or different yeah. I know. I know muscular dystrophy is one of the big ones they're focusing on. Oh, really? Right. Yeah. Cause that's kind of like a single, uh, gene mutation, yeah, um, that kind of causes that. Um, uh, but yeah, so what are your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, just kind of what, where do you think we're going to go and what do you think the next things are going to be here? Yeah. So are you familiar with the Chinese twins that they edited a yeah, couple of years I ago? Am. Yeah. It's yeah. Crazy. So that, that was pretty fucking crazy because they said they edited them to be resistant of HIV. And then they mm. said they were outperforming IQ tests. So mm. they said that, Oh, this HIV gene actually also regulates neurological functions um, we didn't know that. And I'm calling fucking bullshit. Yeah. They intentionally from the get go were making smarter babies and they picked a gene that can also be pitched to the public as antiviral yes. HIV yep. to get yep. everyone on board. Why would we want to get rid of HIV? Well, here's the thing. The same gene does multiple different things in someone's body. Like the APOE gene, a lot of people talk about with Alzheimer's. It also affects cholesterol levels in the blood. That's how it affects Alzheimer's. So there's the HIV antiviral, like my protein that I studied in my lab, it was identified to prevent viral infections. Well, what do you know? That same gene also lets breast cancer cells metastasize in your body by growing these arms that spit out enzymes to break down the collagen in your body. So no one connected those dots there. The same gene yeah. can do multiple different roles in the body. Um, but the scariest part, what they did with those twin girls was um, – I believe the wording is germline CRISPR. I may be botching that a little bit. But basically, for like muscular dystrophy, they can do CRISPR. Like some biohacker did CRISPR into his hand and introduced genetically glowing DNA into his hand to make his cells glow. Um, I actually did that really? to – Yeah. So this biohacker did that. But that's, that's not a problem because it's just in his hand cells. Yeah. Similarly with muscular dystrophy, they do that in your muscle cells and they could fix that muscle. 
The problem is when you do CRISPR on the embryo, mm. which were they, what they did with the twins. So every cell in their body has that genetic mutation, uh, not genetic and en- genetically, en- I guess the engineered genetic mutation. The yes. scary part about that though, those two twin girls in China, they can pass that on to future generations. Oh, so it doesn't just stick with them. If it yeah. just sticks with you, it's one thing. I'll just say, f- fucking go decision. for it. You know, that's yeah. not that's not as big. But if you're introducing a new mutation, for all mm. we know, let's, and and you know, evolutionary biology, different groups of people have different prevalences of mutations based on where they evolved from. That's how we can do ancestry DNA. So if you introduce that to a Chinese population throwing out random ideas here, but let's just say some Alaskan Inuit population has some other type of gene mutation that if they crossbreed, maybe that can cause some interaction that could be Mm. catastrophic, whether it kills them in utero or gives them some benefit in society or a intellectual disability, but that will be Mm. perpetuating into society. So it's definitely those germline ones that we got to be very, very careful about. And the sad thing, I got to agree with you, it's going to be only available to the rich starting out yeah. unless, God forbid, they test these out on the less fortunate, which I wouldn't be surprised if the crazy elites in the world would do. I mean, they'll do crazy, disgusting shit. We yeah. have evidence of that. Authoritarian regimes. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. I mean, China, authoritarian regimes are definitely going to do well, this. Well, I'm pretty sure Russia, sure Russia actually launched a program, a designer baby program. Them in China, oh, I did. think, are in like an arms race for um the designer babies um oh, yeah. i haven't we had i'm pretty sure the guy that did the CRISPR in china he did it off the books released his notebook and then went awol and he was like hiding i'm not sure if they found him or not i mean i don't even know i think those girls should be like i don't know like seven years old now they should be like old by now like we should be able to like we heard they have higher iq we never got an update but even if China heard word, they're not going to release that shit. They're going to keep that under wraps. And how do you trust it too? On top of that, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, but there definitely are certain mutations, like muscular dystrophy, or even the hunt- Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease is one of the few diseases where, if you have the mutation, you're getting the disease. People mm-hmm. that I work with are like, "I'm so nervous about knowing about if I'm going to get cancer or not, or Alzheimer's." And here's the thing: those increase your relative risk. So yeah. let's just say they'll see a report. Oh my God, 40% increased risk of breast cancer. Well, if the breast cancer has, you know, a 1% risk, you're going up to 1.4. Yeah, nothing crazy. You don't add up 40. Yeah. That's what a lot of people get confused about. I'm not to say that, you know, that's not worrying or bothersome. Sure. Like, sure. I, like, like me personally, I have – my dad's side has a lot of cancer. I got this, can- this risk gene that's linked to prostate cancer, colon cancer. Um, am I worried about it? No. I do everything else I could be doing properly. Interestingly, my mom's side of the family all died of strokes, pulmonary embolisms. My brother got a mutation in a clotting protein that lets his blood clot easier. I didn't get that. So I got the cancer gene from my dad's side, not the clotting gene from my mom's side. My brother got the oh, inverse. Okay. And now tell me this wouldn't be the sickest TikTok content. He just moved to Florida, but I got to like get with him to do this. If you try to prick his finger to squeeze blood out, yeah. Nothing comes out because it clots so fast versus mine comes out fine. That's so so I want us to prick our fingers next to yeah. each other and explain that. That will go so fucking viral, but I can't do that side way. by side. It's got to be us next to each other, you know, so no one oh, can yeah. call bullshit. But yeah, yeah. um, kind of off topic, but like I think that's so cool too. Another aspect of this is, huh. you know, I saw some bullshit. A doctor can tell you based on your genes what year you'll die. Fucking bullshit. But – Imagine knowing if you're more likely to die of a stroke, you could take certain systemic, you could take certain supplements to help thin your blood. Um, Or if you're more likely to die of a certain type of um, cancer and you could figure out why, what's the mechanism that works again, even just get tested more regularly for it. I mean, no, no. Well, well, that as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you, if you test positive for, I think it's Lynch syndrome, which is linked to higher colorectal cancer risk due to a couple different genes. Uh I'm pretty sure you can get, um, I'm pretty sure you can get insurance right now to cover it an extra five years early. I believe you can, but you need a whole stack for this is conventional medicine. You need a whole stack of proof with this and that and whatever. And most people don't even want to fucking deal with that. Um, but back to the designer babies. Um, yeah, I definitely think the, also the thing is too, CRISPR can have a lot of off target effects. Um, I actually did CRISPR in my PhD to my breast cancer cells to knock out our gene. 
Um, I knocked out our gene successfully. I checked the DNA, all that, totally gone, clean cut, gone. And there were a lot of other genes that were actually also knocked out. So oh. now, and in a lot of these studies they have, they don't properly check all the other genes. Now, they're yeah. continually making more precise versions of CRISPR. Um, I'm just not totally sold yet on the clinical efficacy that there won't be any F- off-target effects. At least that's for the designer baby's part. Regarding helping muscular dystrophy, I think a lot of people with muscular dystrophy or Huntington's, like they would probably sign off on that and be like, it's fine. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I, I'll yeah, take yeah. the risk and Cost go and benefit. do that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, or even like cerebral palsy or things like that. Um, a lot of these mono, they call it like monogenic um, diseases. So one gene, the hunting gene, that's why it's called Huntington's. The hunting gene, if you have that mutation, you're going to get it. If they can, it, technically, if in the embryo state, they could do a germline mutation of that then they can present that in every cell in the first place. But then one minor step back from that is genetically guided in vitro fertilization. So mm-hmm. let's just say um, you and your wife had a 75% chance of your child having a severe genetic defect, yeah, like either severe intellectual disability or wouldn't make it through the pregnancy or the pregnancy could kill your wife, etc. Rather than rolling the dice, you can sequence the sperm and the egg and you could – let's say you get 10 eggs, 10 sperm or whatever. You could pick which ones them. you want to fertilize together. Yeah, now, I okay. always joke with my wife because she has brown eyes. I have blue eyes. And yep. there's a 50-50 chance our son or daughter, child, has blue eyes. And I'm joking. I'm like 99% kidding. Um, I'm like, well, we should get that done because I really like my blue eyes. I really want my kid yeah. to have blue eyes. You know, I'm sure – We're not going to do that. But, you know, um, it's just interesting how that's not genetic engineering, but it's genetic selection. But it's it's still picking out of the natural possibilities, um, which I think is really, really interesting. And you could also technically pick someone that knows their stuff. You can pick a child that may be more or less anxious or possibly more or less better of athletic features. Again, I guess there would be still a paywall if you could afford that or not. But that's just something the, – the genetically assisted IVF is something I don't hear a lot of people talking about that we're actually doing – I don't think it's like mass widely available today. But in severe cases, you can do that in the United States and pick the non-problematic. But then again, that's, that's where everyone's fine with it. Everyone's fine on that end. But what doctors are taking what money to justify it where you're picking – but again, you're not changing anything that wouldn't naturally be there, so it's much safer. Um, but yeah, yeah, just I and I hear you. I mean, there's so many cool applications here and things that like seem that again everyone would agree on. Getting rid of hunt- Huntington's yeah. disease makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And then the question is: is okay, where does this go? Do you end up with a whole second class of citizens? Have you read the book Homo Deus? By chance? No, I haven't. Yeah, and it, it explores this topic of you know what happens when you end up with a certain percentage of the population that is genetically modified, and what does that do to society? Yep. And I don't know. It's it it's more interesting to think about, but I think we're going to have to think about it more and more as we get further along. I wonder what we're going to have to worry about more sooner. Are we going to have to worry about that sooner or the Neuralink shit sooner? Yeah, I think the Neuralink. If you're too. asking me, like that that that's a whole. I think that is – that's infinitely more powerful than genetically modified in my opinion. Really? Like yeah. I'm, I'm saying with regards to the disparity you can make between the haves and the have-nots. I see. If you have saying. mental connectivity yeah. to the internet through your brain at will, I don't think there's any combination of genetic modifications that can make you that smart. Yeah. Like imagine in having chat GPT in your brain. In your brain. Yeah, I just did a whole podcast on that. That thing's crazy. That's a whole nother – Whole another thing to unpack. I mean, well, right that's there. crazy too, because like, yeah. like the, the the software I use now, Self to Code, it's like twenty three me on steroids. They use artificial intelligence, yeah. machine learning, to impute all of this data and like one one risk score. They'll say, let's say for how how at risk you are for anxiety. I think if they take three hundred eighty thousand different mutations into account, so it's not just a list wow. of individual mutations. Some reports are over a million, but. They can't – like I remember, remember I told you the exact type right, right type of supplement. You can have it good for one mutation but bad for others. Mm. Right now, only I can offer that. But I bet in five years from now, 
obviously I'm going to pivot. I'll figure something out. You need someone to train the AI, sure. but you're going to be able to train an AI to do what I'm doing now, even though I'm doing this hyper boutique, hyper personalized. Like a lot of these companies are mass scale personalized. They can help people, but you're never going to really knowing what I know for true optimization. You can't have a massly mass produced product for that. You got to have one or the other. And right now I want to learn and do it on the really nuanced basis. I think it's fucking cool. And I hate knowing that people are feeling worse from some advice I gave. So I want to make sure I'm giving the right advice. Yeah. Man, yeah, the implications of AI and ChatGPT is just one one example. But what's coming down the pipeline is just going to blow our socks off. It's going to be crazy. But it's again, it's this back to this weird, weird mix. It's what we most want. Like we want more intelligence. We want less diseases in people. Yep. You know, these, these are good things, at least on their face. But they they you end up with all these interesting ethical and societal level questions about like what does this do. And how are we going to handle it? I mean, I think, and- I think Elon said, he was saying, you think AI is going to help because it's going to like, AI is going to go one of two ways. Like it's either going to be used to help free up our time and do boring, monotonous, dangerous jobs to free up our time. But I think the biggest ethical question for that is who benefits, who shares the fruits of the labor of the AI? Is it just yeah. the big corporations that increase their profit margins or is it being shared amongst society? We have less work that needs to be done. So that productivity, basically if it could be like almost like a, some sort of like stimulus compensation check for the AI. So everyone, everyone in the whole country can work, I don't know, three hours less per week or two hours, like something, you know, it's something that'd be the good end. The bad end is, Everyone keeps fucking working and the corporations keep gobbling up. I think we both know in the current society where it's probably going to end up, sadly. Um, but yeah, to a certain extent. Yeah, it's tricky. It's tricky. I, I, have you heard of Andrew Yang? Yep. Yep. Yeah, yep, he, yep. He, was, he was big on uh, – I was, I was a fan of him, but uh, he was big on like UBI, Universal yep. Basic Income. And that's one potential solution. It's more of a Band-Aid. Now, you but, said was. What turned, what turned you off from him? Oh, I don't know if – I don't know if there was like one thing. Oh, okay. okay. He had, he, like he had a lot of interesting. Yeah. Opinions. Like I just I enjoyed his thoughts. I thought he was one of the few like more honest people. Yeah, I agree. In the I'm, I'm not a huge. I'm far from a big political guy, but just hearing, yeah. I totally agree. Just hearing his ideas are definitely a big, big breath of fresh air and like make you think, oh, huh? Man. Like that maybe maybe it wouldn't. I don't know if it would work or not, but like that's an idea, He's right? Trying. You know? Yeah. He had he had a website and he basically had like a list of like his 50 opinions and then like multi-paragraph long explanations as to why he thought that and i was like that should be a bare minimum prerequisite for every politician yeah Yeah. or a joe rogan interview that that too would also be a good prerequisite did he ever have Um, i think he went on there right uh andrew yang no i don't think he went on. he He went on he went on ben shapiro's show his sunday special where he just like interviews people gotcha um anyway so that was good listen to that that was really productive um anyway but yeah it it's that ubi thing's an interesting thing but yeah, I don't know what's going to happen, but it is kind of it's exciting too, and that's the thing. It's exciting and it's also kind of scary, but we're we're going to see. And then one final thing I want to ask you about is you mentioned your fan of psychedelics. Yes. Um what what is okay, well there's many things you can go down here, but what was your first experience with them? Like what got you interested in them? So, for me, it was the first time I went out at a club and I went out and rolled. Um technically that's not, I guess it could be considered psychedelic, but that was my first experience with, I guess, psychopharmacology. So how drugs wait, wait, affect rolled? consciousness, like rolled on Molly at a club. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Yep. So yeah. I wasn't familiar. Yeah, with that so sorry, MDMA. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that no, to good. me was very mm. a big paradigm shift for me. Um, yeah. But um, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think if I first did shrooms or acid first a couple of years ago, but. Um, I can't remember which one was first, but um, very, very impactful for me. And throughout the years, um, I've personally been more of like I, I'm not, I've never been really that much of a microdose type of guy. Mm-hmm. Um, I personally would rather do. I like the macro. I like the altered state of consciousness, and mm-hmm. I'd purposely rather do that every couple of months and try to get some insights and intuition about things. But um, I mentioned that BDNF mutation I had. Yeah, um, makes me so my afterglows are, you know, that after, afterglow, I'm meaning like 
I feel better afterwards. Like if someone's ever had like a good trip or like, you know, not taking a bunch of acid at like some packed ass club with bottle service, whatever. No, I'm talking yeah. about go yeah. take some clean shit with a few good people, one sober trip sitter, go in nature in the middle of the fucking day and like, you know, just chill out, maybe smoke a joint at the end, not during, you know, yes, way at yep. the end. And you will feel that after you feel after the fact is much more pronounced for me. And I respond very, very well to that. I never, I never suffered from depression per se, but anxiety wise, um, some of them helped have helped me a lot with that. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think they're definitely going to revolutionize medicine as well. Not even yeah. just for depression, autoimmunity. Um, that's going to be a huge one as yeah. well. Um, I actually just recorded a reel that I'm going to post soon. I think it could also be used to treat things like mold infections and viral infections. It actually really? dr- – they dramatically boost your body's glutathione production. Interesting. Yeah. So no – They did that. No one – I haven't heard – this is literally my own independent idea that huh. this this pathway, the NRF2 pathway. So the BDNF gets raised, but it's through this yep. pathway, NRF2, NRF2 pathway. That's what signals down, tells your body to make more BDNF to grow new brain cells. It also tells your body to make more glutathione. Mold hijacks your body's NRF2 pathway. So it deactivates it and suppresses it. So once it's there, you can't clear it out because your body doesn't have any glutathione. So again, no one's fucking clinically checking this. No one probably ever will. But I'm thinking if you combine this with the right other, you know, other supportive supplements, I'm not saying, you know, a microdose of shrooms or two hits of acid will cure your mold. You know, yeah, don't take yeah, don't yeah, take yeah. this in wrong with the people. This is a very speculative, hypothetical hypothesis from a from a pharmacologist here. But yeah. could that be like I said, if getting the vitamin D right, if getting if taking you know N acetylcysteine and glycine can, that can get you like thirty percent of the way there. If that microdose can you know help you that other ten percent, or also I think that the mental psyche. If you have a traumatic victim mindset and unrepressed, unresolved re- emotions deep down, I think the body keeps the score of these things. And a psychedelic experience, macrodose, can heal you of these deep-rooted traumas. And I think that is a significant driver of people's poor health as well. We know stress causes depression, anxiety, yeah. lowers the immune system. Well, it lowers the immune system, so couldn't it promote mold infection, toxicity? And it's weird to me. A lot of people are like, Okay, yes, it lowers the immune system. Yes, it causes depression. No, that couldn't cause mold. And it's like, what are you guys talking about? Like, it's the same flow of logic here. I think people just are hesitant to admit that these substances can have so many huge yeah. uh, effects for people. But I do think it's very important to – I'm personally one of those people. I think pretty much everything should just be legalized and let people figure it out. But mm-hmm. – In the real world, that's not really how it goes. So I do think we need to play very carefully with um, making sure we take our time doing the medicinal clinical side of stuff properly. Like Mm -hmm. people can – people can go crazy. You know, These can unleash certain schizophrenia type phenotypes in people. Mm -hmm. So like I really don't think everyone should just go and try mushrooms with their friends. Like I think some people – I have known some people that seem to have it pretty okay together. And they take these things and they kind of go off the deep end and they're never really the same after. That being said, I've also heard even more, more often, it's beautiful stories about it. Um, But yeah, I'm clearly a huge fan of these things. They've changed my life in a lot of beneficial ways, but they can also affect people unfavorably. There actually is one genetic company testing for your responsiveness to the psychedelics. So they can tell what dose do you need. Before you do it. Are we going to give you a regular dose and you're going to be off the huh. deep end? I've been with some people that I've tripped with that took half the dose I took and yeah. literally were like nonverbal drooling on the floor. They were fine. They had a good time. But they were literally sure, like sure. – they were on like a gram and a half of mushrooms. I took an eighth and they looked like they were on nine grams. And like – wow. ironically, yeah. I do think it kind of depends on where you were from. She was from, she was from the Dominican Republic. So I think that – I also think evolutionarily, I think a lot of the – Aborigine tribes, you know, like where psychedelics originated from have genetics, like where mushrooms grew. I think those populations have a higher chance of having genetics that make them hyper responders to it. I think that shamans and villages, the ones that could speak to all these spirits, I think they have mutations that make them hyper responsive to the drugs. Interesting. Yeah, it's interesting thing to think about. 
Yeah, psychedelics are a fascinating rabbit hole to go down. Um, we can say that for next uh, time. Yeah, no, right? <laughs> but but no, uh, thanks for coming on. Obviously, there's you know a million things we could keep talking about here, and it's been a lot of fun. Um, I appreciate your man. You got a lot of knowledge, so that's pretty cool. I love I love to see you passionate about it and doing something truly impactful. Like seriously, I mean, making a difference in people's lives and things that like the conventional medical community just isn't addressing yep. in, in, in the way that you are. Yeah, I'm and I'm, and I'm, I'm also trying to improve upon the holistic side as well. You know, regarding yeah. the right. I think, you know, in the next next couple of months, I definitely want to have a practitioner, holistic practitioner training program, you know, whether it's however many, many hours of lectures to teach about the main contraindications for natural supplements. And yeah. even if you made it four hours of lectures, I think every medical doctor should take it because at the end of the day, if you're a patient, even if you're a regular doctor, if they're on medications, you should know what natural supplements they're on and how they interact with those. Yeah, it's your job yeah, for sure. It's it shouldn't just be exactly what you're prescribing. One narrow thing, yeah. No, I hear you. But I I'll try you. not to go down another rabbit hole because then we'll be here another nah, forty five minutes. But yeah, no, we could be, we could be. But no, I appreciate you coming on. Um, awesome discussion. Thanks for your knowledge. Um, yeah. So, any uh, closing thoughts? Uh, anyone here listening that is not content with their current health status, that's um, interested in trying a new wave of holistic medicine, feel free to reach out. Or if not you, every single person on the face of the earth knows someone that's not happy with where their health is yeah. at. Um, if they're sick of taking pills, not feeling better, Band-Aid fixes, please reach out. Or even bare minimum, if you found this interesting, just share this to someone. Um, find me on Instagram at Pansner. P-A-N-Z-N-E-R. I'm sure he'll probably post my information as well. Yeah. But I'm really, really just trying to get this mission and my mission statement out there. I think it is an absolute no-brainer first place to start before you go doing all these crazy functional labs, all this stuff. Like going back to Gallagher for the closing statement. Sure. I think – part of me thinks we should be sequenced at birth like Gattaca because if it was me running the world – I wouldn't let bad shit happen with that. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. clearly I'm not running the world. So I understand why that could end poorly. But knowing your genetic makeup can is the pros so far outweigh the potential cons. I think the whole, you know, they're going to jack me up for insurance, this and that. We know nothing about genetics grand scheme right now. I think maybe our grandkids have to worry about their genetic information being out. But, sure. um, you know, if people are that worried about it, I always say use a fake name on the DNA kit. They're not going to know shit. That's the easiest fix. If you're that paranoid about it, which you know what? That's fine. I'm not bashing you at all. You can use a fake name. But long-winded ending statement. But thank you so much for having me on, man. And no, sure. everyone listening, have an awesome rest of their day. Appreciate it.